So, yeah, so it, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, today's uh, LAMP seminar speaker, Nozomi Nishimura. So just as a brief introduction to, to Nozomi, um, she received her bachelor's degree in physics from Harvard. Then uh, that's where she started working on a femtosecond laser ablation, So, which became very uh, instrumental in her PhD research, which she then conducted as a NSF-funded uh, graduate research fellow at UC San Diego. Um, so she worked with uh, David Kleinfeld there. Um, and so she, she became interested in neuroscience and, and David does some really interesting work at the interface of optics and, and neuroscience. And so, you know, the, the work that Nozomi was able to uh, accomplish there was really, was truly seminal work. Um, and it was a really cool marriage of um, the precision of femtosecond laser ablation with um, the exquisite spatial resolution of multi-photon microscopy. And they were able, and she was able to use both of those to, in concert to um, study the cerebrovascular dynamics that were associated with uh, really selective induction of um, microscopic strokes. And so it was some, re some really groundbreaking work that she achieved there. Um, and in 2006, she uh, moved to Cornell um, as a postdoctoral scholar first, and then she joined the, the biomedical engineering faculty um, and she, in 2013, and now she's an associate professor there. And her group remains interested in uh, developing and employing multi-photon microscopy uh, to perform detailed in vivo studies um, of the structure and functional uh, behavior of organs during disease progression. And today she's gonna inform us on some of the recent, the really exciting work that she's been doing, uh, looking at the intimate role um, that the vasculature plays in modulating both the brain and heart health as well. So Nozomi, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, it is an honor to be able to, to at least virtually come and, and talk to you. So today I'm gonna to tell you about research um, that has descended from early research. I mean, it's actually even related to stuff that as Bernard was saying that I did um, as an undergrad. So hopefully I can convince you that I've made some progress, but um, um, I'll be talking about some things in the brain and then um, sort of a new direction for us is looking at using some of these in vivo tools in, in the heart. So, um, the reason why I like to use multi-photon microscopy is it lets us look at all the different cells. And then I often feel like I want to use this slide for neuroscientists to remind them that it's not just neurons in the brain, it's other kinds of things like astrocytes and micro, uh, microglia and blood vessels. But um, um, in all of these organs, what we see when we're studying disease is sort of an interaction of all these different kinds of cells. And so um, it's really my favorite thing to be able to use something like intravital microscopy and basically go and look and see what kind of happens. Um, I'm almost a tourist um, to go and see what the behavior of all these things are. So I like to think about it as like taking a safari and seeing what all of the different different little creatures, even though they're cells, what they do and how they interact with their, um, their environments. So today I'm gonna to tell you about um, some of these things in the brain. Um, and I will be talking a little bit about Alzheimer's disease. Let me see, make sure that I can see my, hopefully you can see the pointer. So I'll be talking a little bit about Alzheimer's disease and I will talk, be talking about some uh, work that descended from our ability to make microvascular lesions that started um, at UCSD in the Kleinfeld lab. And then I'll be talking about some of the similar things that we're doing in cardiac image, imaging. And one of the themes that will come out is that um, we end up looking a lot at the microvasculature and, um, and defaults, or not defaults, um, defects in, in the microvasculature have important roles, um, we think in Alzheimer's disease. And then with these new imaging um, capabilities, we're starting to get the idea that some of these very small capillaries with very small problems also have uh, important um, implications for cardiac disease as well. So with that, I'm gonna just um, do a quick background of Alzheimer's disease. Um, unfortunately, probably many of us are familiar with Alzheimer's disease because it is just so common. Um, these numbers are old, but um, you know, the cost of Alzheimer's disease is, is going to be enormous um, and, it's, and it's just growing. So there's no cure for Alzheimer's disease even today. And there have been so many clinical trials that fail um, uh, and in large part because I think we don't have a good understanding of, of the full complexity of Alzheimer's disease. So Alzheimer's disease um, is uh, mainly dominated by the amyloid hypothesis. And of course, there's some controversy on exactly how important it is. But amyloid beta peptide or amyloid beta, the peptide sequence, um, is certainly an important player. 
So amyloid beta is a peptide that um, accumulates at high concentrations in the brains of Alzheimer's patients. Um, it's, 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 a, it's actually sort of a byproduct of the processing of a protein, amyloid precursor protein. And A beta gets snipped off in normal, um, normal activity and normal processing. Um, APP, that protein has many important functions, um, probably related a lot to things like membrane trafficking. It's very important in, um, in things like development, also in, um, in neural activity, probably through um, some synaptic recycling vesicle um, kind of mechanisms. But it's not clear what this A-beta does. And it's interesting because we all produce a large amount of A-beta in our brains all of the time. Um, and we sort of think about it as um, a waste product. And, we, and um, it's, it's part of the normal metabolism of brain. So I think that's one of the reasons why Alzheimer's disease has been so hard to get rid of um, because this, this A-beta fragment, um, it's being made every day uh, during normal function. And it even increases when, when, you, um, when you increase your neural activity through healthy um, cognition and, and thinking and that sort of thing. So, um, Anyway, the accumulation of amyloid beta is sort of the hallmark of um, Alzheimer's disease patients. And um, in patients, it starts to accumulate to the levels where it will start to aggregate. And the aggregates um, seem to be more toxic, especially if they're sort of aggregates of low num numbers of um, A beta peptide copies um, and they are still soluble. Eventually they aggregate to the point where they uh, sort of fall out of solution and, and they form these A beta plaques. This is in vivo imaging, um, I think from the Hyman lab um, that where, with a dimethoxy XO4 where you can see these, these almost, well, very beautiful structures, these plaques in the, in the brains of Alzheimer's um, mice. At any rate, the idea is that then when the concentration of A beta gets quite high, that's when you start to get um, neurotoxic effects. And um, most of the Alzheimer's world is worried about what the, um, what the A-beta does to neurons and it causes things like um, dystrophy and the neurites and then, and then eventually cell death. The other um, symptom of Alzheimer's disease that's actually been known for a very long time but is less explained is that Alzheimer's disease patients have a lower degree of blood flow than age match controls or healthy patients. And um, that, that change in blood flow um, can be as much as 30% uh, lower than healthy controls. And so this is true of the clinical population where um, where uh, like, uh, for example, this is a, an arterial spin MRI study, um, but it's also true in, um, in, um, in animal models. And there's a lot of um, epidemiological evidence that suggests that uh, vascular health is important for Alzheimer's disease. Um, but um, on the surface, I, I don't think it's a, a completely obvious why this amyloid beta protein aggregation should be linked to vascular disease. So, um, we started using in vivo multiphoton microscopy in mouse models of Alzheimer's disease. And then we asked a couple questions. We had um, some tools to make vascular lesions. So we looked at the interactions between vascular lesions and amyloid beta deposits with the hypothesis that perhaps if you have clots or, or um, disruptions in the vasculature that could interact with the amyloid beta. And eventually we also um, looked at some um, spontaneous dysfunction in the capillaries. Okay, so we used in most of these studies, um, APP PS1 mice. Um, so these have um, a subset of the mutations that are associated with Alzheimer's disease. Um, and of course we are putting in craniotomies, um, which allows us to look over um, many weeks um, to two months. And then um, in these studies, actually, these are all under, an, an, uh, sorry, under anesthesia because we're mostly looking at structural things um, and even the blood flow effects that we saw um, don't require uh, awake imaging. So we do put, the, put these, these windows and then um, image and then this is a typical stack of, stack of vasculature in an Alzheimer's mouse. We also use a dye called methoxy XO4, and every once in a while you see a little red blip as we go deeper in the brain. The vasculature here is labeled with an IV injection of um, intravenous dye. Let me see if I can just play that movie again. Um, and so you can see uh, we're going from um, the surface of the brain down and you can see the nice spaghetti-like capillaries and every once in a while a red blip that is um, the methoxy XO4 amyloid beta plaque. 
So this is pretty pretty typical imaging of Alzheimer's um, mouse models. Um, the other thing that we did, and this is, um, I was just mentioning that some of my stuff is all the way back from grad school, and here it is. Um, we, uh, back in grad school in David Kleinfeld's lab, we developed ways to clot um, basically any vessel that we wanted to. And one of uh, these methods was an older methods with um, photothrombosis with rose bengal dye. And that's convenient for, for some of the surface vessels and the big vessels. We also used um, high intensity uh, photo disruption with femtosecond lasers, sort of a, a higher power version of, of the femtosecond lasers that you use for two photon imaging. And we uh, basically disrupted a single vessel as small as a capillary. And so this is a movie of um, um, actually technically a pre-capillary arterial. So um, one or two branches off of an arterial in the mouse brain. And you can see the red blood cells going by as little streaks. And then in this example, we're using the femtosecond laser to clot um, this vessel, and we're firing the femtosecond laser into the middle, and you start to see the endogenous clotting um, process start to uh, occlude this vessel as sort of some of the, a little bit of the blood plasma starts to leak out. Get a little bit more of an extensive leak, and then we get um, a clot that fills up that vessel. Um, and then um, when we zoom out, you can see that this vessel is clotted. There's some dye leaking around the, the, um, the, the perimeter, um, but all the other vessels are intact. So you can really un understand what the, um, the occlusion effects are on this vessel and then go ahead and study the other vessel. So that's what we did for a long time. So we did a lot of these detailed studies where we clotted different classes of vessels and then um, before and after then measured the um, speeds of the red blood cells. Um, and long story short, um, we found that um, there's lots of interesting variations of the kinds of vessels and their topology that we have, but um, you can get sort of different classes of blood flow reductions depending on whether you're, you're occluding a single capillary or um, most severely if you occlude the arterioles that sort of uh, bridge in between the larger surface arterioles and the tiny capillaries inside. So. Um, we went and measured basically um, um, after you do occlusions of all these different vessels um, types, what the blood flow change was um, as you go one, two, and three and four branches away. So um, in the Alzheimer's um, animals, we were interested in looking at the interactions between um, some of the smaller vessels, but not the tiny, well, we, okay, the tiniest to the smallest vessels, um, I would say, um, in the brain, because, um, the blood flow deficits in the Alzheimer's patients are not accompanied necessarily by large strokes. So we, we were really interested in looking at uh, occlusions and blockages in sort of the smaller class of these vessels. So um, the penetrating arterioles and, and some of the capillaries. So we use these tools to look at, um, at uh, the effects of um, putting in occlusions in some of the big blood vessels um, or the small blood vessels of the, uh, of the mouse brain. And, um, and we use methoxy XO4, the dye, to look at um, the plaques at the same time. And so these are images, time-lapse images from baseline um, showing the vasculature in Alzheimer's mice. And on the top row, we've occluded this vessel in the middle here. And, um, and these white images are just showing the methoxy XO4 channel. So just the uh, plaque channel, the amyloid beta plaque channel. And at the beginning, um, you can see that this animal is pretty far along. It has lots of, um, lots of plaques all over. Um, and the bottom here is just control. Um, and so it's actually probably the contralateral side, or actually this is probably a different mouse, uh, but you can see the vasculature and, and also a lot of plaques. And so um, we were actually quite surprised to see that in many places, what actually happens is when you put in an occlusion, um, the plaques changed in shape and in some cases actually completely disappeared. So this is quite surprising because um, uh, we had a pretty, well, I thought it was a strong hypothesis that um, the way that vascular injuries would interact with Alzheimer's disease is that you would put in an injury like this and it would actually increase the deposit of um, amyloid beta. And we had expected to see um, an increase in, um, in sort of these methoxy XO4 um, plaques. So very interesting when we see exactly the opposite effect of, um, of um, what I thought. 
Um, if you look at the details of some of this, though, you can kind of see that some of these plaques actually sort of change shape. Like um, there's there's sort of a haze here, and then some of these seem to, I think that one's the same one, it actually constricts and maybe gets brighter. So um, perhaps it's not quite the same as just completely um, disappearing. At any rate, um, oh yeah, we can see some quantification of, of actually the increase um, um, in, in the brightness, um, but also um, the chain, the actually a decrease in, in the um, um, in the occlusions, or, or sorry, a decrease in the number of plaques. Okay, so so here's an image that also shows this um, alongside of the um, the microglia. So the microglia are the resident uh, macrophages in the brain, and this is a mouse that has both the the genes for um, Alzheimer's disease, so it makes these amyloid beta plaques in in this teal color, um, and the microglia here are expressing um, GFP. So um, in the unperturbed brain, even in Alzheimer's disease, the microglia tend to have these ramified morphologies um, and, um, and there is some aggregation around some of these plaques. And then um, in, this, in this example here, we again put in an occlusion in one of these penetrating arterioles on the, on the top, the bottom is um, the control. And um, at the same time, um, we could see the plaques so um, this plaque sort of changes in shape um, and some of these other plaques sort of disappear. This example just has a couple of plaques in it. Um, at the same time, you can also see the activation of the, of the microglia. Um, using this mouse, um, the, uh, the, the GFP signal fades a little bit. Um, the microglia are still there, um, but it does fade indicating that there's sort of a, a phenotype switch. Um, but it does also then, um, um, sort of come back with an increase in, in these microglia cells um, and a change in, in morphology that, and that um, indicates activation. And um, roughly the timing of, um, of these plaque changes and um, these um, inflammatory cell, the microglia changes um, um, are all sort of happening all at the same time. So um, one question is what's happening to the plaques? Oh, sorry, th these are more zoomed in images where you can see um, in this example, the microglia, um, there is a subset that sort of gathers around plaques um, 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 uh, naturally. And then as the plaque disappears, um, there's sort of a, sort of a, a um, um, I guess an inverse correlation with how much these really activated microglia seem to show up um, when the plaques are, um, disappear. Okay, so um, one thing is though, this plaque disappearance is really surprising because um, we had sort of thought about plaques as a very inert form. And one theory about why plaques are formed in Alzheimer's disease is sort of a, a safety mechanism where this amyloid beta is um, aggregated into this highly concentrated fibular form. And um, once you get it out of solution, it, it's, it's, um, it's more stable and therefore less pathological. So um, people um, call these plaques sort of the the gravestones that mark um, an Alzheimer's disease uh, brain, in part because these plaques stay and are stable after the disease has, has, is, is running its course. And, um, and the idea was that these plaques were, were really something that, that sticks around. Once they're there, they're not going to be um, that dynamic. So the, the idea that these things are disappearing was quite, quite surprising. So we wanted to know where they're going. And um, this is a case where we actually couldn't use in vivo imaging because we needed to actually look um, um, even deeper than, than we could um, um, look. And the other thing that we needed to look at was the different forms of amyloid beta. So the plaques, um, and this is a histology slice then, just a, a slice through the cortex. The plaques, um, show up in blue with this methaxy XO4 dye, and that shows fibrillar plaques, so these concentrated plaques. Um, but uh, this dye, um, it only binds to the fibrillar form because it needs sort of these, these uh, beta sheet aggregations. Um, and so you can't actually see soluble A beta. So um, this is one of the reasons we really had to do a histological study to follow up. So to look at um, the amyloid beta in its other format, we had to use anti-amyloid beta antibodies. And so in these images, in these cortical slices, 
um, um, these are in red. And these are also mice that um, were transgenic for the, the microglia in green. And you can see some of the neurons in yellow as well. So this is a section right through the center of um, one of these um, small uh, occlusions or or centered up on one of these small occlusions. And um, what you can see is that there is a disappearance of these amyloid of the blue fibrillar methoxy exo 4 plaques, but it's sort of replaced by um, a, an increase in the amyloid beta staining with antibodies. And so this actually indicates that these plaques disappeared, um, but they may have converted into this more soluble form. And so we can no longer see it in vivo with these um, with the methoxy exo 4 dye. Um, but this actually does not indicate a good thing for Alzheimer's disease because the soluble form of A-beta is thought to be more toxic um, and is, is, um, is, is better at binding um, rather than the fibrillar form. So this actually suggests that even though that we saw a disappearance in these plaques, um, we may have been seeing a transition that's actually quite detrimental, that this actually was, indicates the release of um, a toxic form. And these are sort of the zoomed in images here that you can see that um, um, the amyloid beta does seem to be scattered all over the place um, in, inside sort of this, this bright region. So this is quite rapid. So this is 24 hours or so after we put in the occlusion. And then um, several days later, at, um, four days after the occlusion, you start to see that this um, cloud, this haze of amyloid beta does go away. Um, but, but it starts to aggregate um, again. And it seems to aggregate around some of these um, microglia cells. So perhaps we're seeing sort of a recollection or re-sequestration of, um, of the amyloid beta as, as, the, um, as the, the stroke sort of goes through its, um, its progression. You can also see um, an infiltration of all sorts of other sorts of um, immune and inflammatory cells. And so there's a lot of um, changes happening in both the microglia and, um, and some of the other immune cells that come around. Okay, so um, we were pretty excited about this story because um, this was an unexpected finding that this amyloid beta plaques are, are so, um, that they're, they're not stable and that you can, um, or they can dissolve. Um, the biology of why they dissolve is something that we're trying to pursue. Um, it is, it is, I am not sure that that isn't gonna be a good therapy because I think this, this kind of um, reaction is actually um, probably making more toxic amyloid beta um, available. And perhaps that's why some of the anti-amyloid uh, drugs have failed um, because you get rid of the plaques, but you get it worse. At any rate, um, I think this this because because it's quite common to have these microstrokes um, as you age. This kind of interaction is probably happening in the brains of patients um, quite a bit. Okay, so just to summarize this part. Um, we found that fibrillar plaques, which were thought to be stable, um, can disappear in a single day um, around a microstroke, which suggests that infl inflammation and um, um, these injury-related processes can do something to these plaques. Um, that A-beta does clear over several um, days, but I don't think it is necessarily a good way to get rid of um, A-beta because it does seem to be in a more toxic form. So this, is, this study was all done with um, laser-based occlusions um, where we went and targeted um, a, a vessel. But it does turn out that there's quite a bit of spontaneous microvascular function as well. And um, I like to say that, you know, we actually spent a lot of time and lasers and, and effort trying to put in little clots and these little vessels. But it turns out as an undergraduate in the lab, um, 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 with, uh, oh, I should also say this is, this is all, um, done in the jointly run lab that I have now with Chris Schaefer, um, who many of you know. Anyway, one of the undergrads, um, that was one of his first undergrads was actually looking in the brains of the Alzheimer's mice. And this is a movie that shows, um, the, some of the capillaries. And what you'll notice is that, um, there are some vessels like this one right here, where there appears to be something stuck. 
And so even though we you know, worked very hard to but caught some things in the brains of Alzheimer's mice, it turns out that Alzheimer's mice already had um, a quite high incidence of stalled capillaries all on their own. So this is not as um, drastic as some of the lesions that we were putting in because this is on the capillary side and some of the lesions that we're studying um, in the work I just told you about were like one step um, larger on the, the, the bridge in between the arterioles, but, the, um, but it's all still on the microvascular side. So um, it, um, um, after some investigation, we found out that these, um, these, these stalls are caused by um, leukocytes and specifically they're caused by neutrophils. And these neutrophils, um, they adhere to the inside of the vessel, but they don't seem to penetrate the vessel. They just seem to get stuck there. And on average, um, they stay there a couple of minutes um, and, then, and then they move on and stay in the blood. And so they're not doing their sort of traditional role of, um, of inflammation and, um, and invading the tissue, but they just seem to be sticking in the, in the capillaries for just a few minutes, stopping all the blood flow in that particular capillary um, um, before, before they move on. And um, we quantified this, um, manually had lots of people involved in counting, and it turns out that um, uh, there's about one, um, somewhere between one and 2% of the capillaries that are stalled in these Alzheimer's mice, but in their age matched non-transgenic controls, that's sort of more um, at like a half percent. So it's not a huge change, um, uh, but it is, but it is a, uh, um, Oh, sorry. This is this is this is not the wild type. This is with treatment. Um, but 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 it is a, a significant um, effect. The other thing that we found out was that now I'm talking about this graph um, because it's neutrophils. We found out that we can um, deplete or interfere with its adhesion with an antibody against Lysix-G, which is a surface protein on Alzheimer's disease, and then you can drop the um, level of stalls. Um, or stalled capillaries down to something that is very similar to uh, wild type levels. And this is exciting because um, we're then able to get rid of, um, of, of these stalls completely and um, look at the impact of that. So um, it turns out that um, um, this does have a significant effect on blood flow. Um, and um, so what, what the way that we measured blood flow in, in these animals is that we basically uh, measured blood flow individually in some of the arterioles that feed the brain. And it's a pretty good measure of what kind of um, blood flow is going to the cortex of the brain because the cortex is pretty well fed by these um, arterioles. And so when we measured um, the, uh, the flow um, in, in these um, Alzheimer's mice, what we did is we then um, treated them and with this Lysix-G antibody to get rid of the neutrophils. And then we found out that we could get um, a, a fairly significant increase in the blood flow to the brain in the Alzheimer's mice um, uh, when we got rid of the stalls. And so um, this is actually true in, um, let me move my thing here. This is true in both young animals um, at sort of the beginning of, of the disease um, as well as animals that are, are quite advanced into the disease. So in this model, um, um, uh, 14 months is, is getting there. And we can also see this rescue um, even out to about 18 months. So, so you can improve blood flow um, quite far into the disease where these animals already have um, lots of plaques. Okay. So um, the magnitude of the blood flow, um, interestingly, is actually pretty close to um, what we see in Alzheimer's patients. So if you, if, you, um, if, you, if you assume that getting rid of the stalls is, is basically um, reflects the blood flow in, in a healthy Alzheimer's brain, then it matches sort of the idea that Alzheimer's disease in mice models um, creates about a 25 to 30% decrease in blood flow. And that actually does match the number that um, is observed in patients. And so um, we are not able to look in patients yet. And I'm um, very interested to see if there are methods for doing that. Um, but this sort of suggests that this, this effect in capillaries could actually account for a relatively large um, change in blood flow. And it's of, of a magnitude that is um, similar to and perhaps relevant for patients. 
So as we go forward, we'll hopefully find something that we could translate into patients and then, and then maybe eventually test this idea out. Okay, so let's see. Um, blood flow is nice, um, but we also want to really um, test cognition, right? Um, that's what we're really, really, what, what we really care about. And so um, um, in, uh, in mouse models, one of the great ways to test um, uh, memory, short-term memory in Alzheimer's disease is um, a novel object replacement task. So what we did is we tested these Alzheimer's mice and uh, wild type controls um, in this task. And the way it works is that you put a mouse in a box with two toys. Um, they could be like little statues or something like that. And uh, mice are, are curious, so they will go and explore and like um, sniff at these little um, toys. And you can quantify how much time their, um, their heads um, and their noses spend in the vicinity of the toys. And then we take the mouse out and then we have a delay of about 90 minutes. Um, and then what we do is we move one of the toys to a new location, same toy, um, but goes to a new place. Or sometimes you can, also, you can also replace the toy with a new toy. And then a normal mouse will realize that something changed about this toy and spend a little bit more time there. Um, but an Alzheimer's mouse um, per, presumably doesn't quite uh, remember what was the situation before and doesn't realize that something's different about this. And so it'll split its time pretty evenly among the two toys. So here's some data sort of in a, in a simplified format. This graph is showing um, how much time the, uh, a wild type mouse um, spends at, um, at the toy that has been moved. And so it's a little bit over half the time. An Alzheimer's mouse, however, spends um, just about exactly half the time um, split in between the two toys. And very excitingly, we found that when we treat the blood flow and get the blood flow increase, um, you actually rescue um, and in the Alzheimer's mice treated with um, Li6G antibody, you actually get a um, uh, performance in the short-term memory task that is comparable to the um, wild type mice. What's also very exciting about this data, oh, there's the controls, it doesn't do very much, is that this was tested in the same mice. So this was tested um, with a very short interval, just three hours um, afterwards. Um, and so this was the same mouse actually showing improved short-term memory performance with um, an acute injection. And this performance changes within three hours. And the controls, of course, um, have this, the, the three-hour interval as well, and you don't really see an interval. So um, this, is, this is quite interesting to us because um, here, um, you know, most of the theories about Alzheimer's disease have been really focusing on the effect of this amyloid beta protein. Um, and the thought was that it's, it's inhibiting neural um, function for some reason. But we're indicating that at least in, in this particular task, that the function can um, increase again at, in a very, very short time scale. And the thing that we think we're doing is improving blood flow by get, getting rid of the stalls. So it sort of gives us sort of an alternate way to um, think about uh, where the cognitive effects of um, Alzheimer's disease come from. Okay, to summarize this part of the talk then, um, we find that roughly 2% of capillaries are spontaneously stalled in the Alzheimer's mouse models. Um, the stalls are caused by neutrophils and um, it's a neutrophil just sticking in a capillary segment but not doing very much um, otherwise. We think this is like a 20, 30% decrease in blood flow. Um, and then if we get rid of this, we can improve cognitive um, um, performance in mouse models. So, you know, maybe, maybe this is a, a new way to sort of think about things. Um, I did want to point out that the way that we do this analysis for finding stalls is actually um, quite manual right now, um, but we have some help from, um, from, uh, from community members. So um, in, in, in uh, collaboration with the, the Human Computation Institute, um, we set up a online game. So um, if you like, you can go to it during the seminar. I won't complain at all. But anyway, if you go to stallcatchers.com, we have examples of our raw data here. And you can see some red blood cells going in, in the blood vessels here. Um, and um, the uh, citizen scientists can use this web interface to then tell us um, whether a particular capillary is stalled or not stalled. And so our ongoing studies where we're trying to find things like um, we're trying to screen for new compounds. We're also looking at interactions of uh, different environmental factors like high fat diet, um, which um, the story um, was more complicated. But anyway, we're looking at, at different genetic and, um, 
and other factors that interact with this um, uh, with this stalling phenomenon to and also trying to look at the causes of this. So all of our um, we're trying starting to make put a lot of our data analysis to um, this online platform. So feel free if you like to switch to stallcatchers.com and uh, and help us out. Okay. So for the last part, I'm actually going to then switch gears to talk about heart imaging. And so um, there's been a lot of students and postdocs that have been involved in this. Um, uh, the original person actually was Jason Jones, who graduated, and then um, um, uh, Nash um, is still here. Dave is a postdoc. Um, um, Mike is a research associate. And then um, Lila and Anne are, are more recent additions to the project. But uh, so heart imaging, we've been working on for a while. Um, and um, it's, I think, um, as clinically important as, as brain imaging for the microvascular flow world, because just like the heart, the brain cannot sustain um, long, or long decreases in, in, in blood flow as well. Of course, it's really challenging to study blood flow in the heart itself, so in the heart muscle itself, uh, because it's moving and, and it's its own pump. So you really have to have the motion there to be able to understand um, what the vascular function inside the heart is. So we've been working on this a while, and here's sort of our scheme for doing this in mice. So we do an open chest preparation. Um, and sort of worked on making this more minimal so you can kind of go through the um, in between some of the ribs. But in the end, um, what we do is we put a, um, we actually glue a uh, metal ring with a cover glass onto, um, onto the surface of the heart and stabilize a small part of, um, of, of the heart tissue. Um, we use a biocompatible tissue adhesive and it turns out that we, we, we generally use vet bond or Loctite. Um, and then we do our imaging through the window. So this um, is a movie that shows that. So this is this is the ring um, with the, the glass in the middle and this is the heart beating around it. Um, and you can see the vasculature is still flowing um, around uh, or inside, inside um, the, the window. So when we do two photon microscopy here, um, um, there are more traditional two photon microscopes have sort of a slower frame rate. And then within this frame rate, you can see a lot of distortion because the heart rate is um, several beats per, per um, frame in here. Um, so if we go to resonance scanners that are more like at 30 frames per second, um, you still get um, quite a bit of motion, but it, it gets a little bit better. So to really make these images, um, um, to stabilize them in a way that we can do uh, real analysis, what we do is um, we resort all of the images according to where they are in um, the cardiac and in our case in the um, in the breathing phase as well. So this kind of resorting of images according to cardiac phase is done um, quite commonly in, in human imaging as well with like um, CT techniques and um, MRI techniques. Um, in our variation of this, um, we also have the animals, they're ventilated, um, but we keep them breathing the, during this whole time. And so the breathing motion and the cardiac motion contribute to motion of the tissue. So we actually resort um, um, individual lines in each of our images um, by where they occur in both the cardiac cycle and um, the respiratory cycle. And then for each um, combination of of phase in both of these cycles, we can reconstruct um, a volume by um, like uh, resorting all the, the image lines that are close, um, as close as possible to the desired 2D sort of phase space, the 2D, um, the uh, point in the cardiac and the respiratory cycle. And so you can, we can reconstruct these 3D volumes. So here's an example of a 3D volume um, reconstructed in a mouse that is expressing GCAMP and everything's freezing, but that's okay. Um, so the green here is G-camp in the cardiac myocytes. And so you're seeing an action potential. Um, and um, the, the magenta is some of the, the blood vessels um, that are coursing through the tissue here. Um, and so this, this, this volume was reconstructed from um, um, an entire, or it's a reconstruction of a cardiac cycle. And then you can see the G-camp flashing in the, um, in the cardiac tissue. 
So you, with this, you can now use for quantitative analysis. And um, we looked at things like the G-CAMP signal across um, for the sort of 2D cardiac versus rep respiratory cycle. And um, for most of the time we do just, when we're thinking about the heart, we really um, just look at the cardiac cycle, but the respiratory cycle also makes a big difference in, um, in both the mechanical environment and also the oxygenation and, um, and the pressures that the, the, the heart is, is, um, is, is feeling as well. And so I think it's actually interesting to look at both um, the, to look at this full cardiac um, and respiratory cycle for, for function. Okay, so using GCAMP, we can also look at the, um, the function of individual cells. And this is, these are sort of line outs looking at individual myocytes. And these are two big red blood cells, or sorry, not uh, big blood vessels. And you can see the little red blood cells in here. Um, and then this is um, in um, normal heart. And this is in a region um, in, a, in, a, uh, in a heart where we've actually done a, a, a laser burn in here. And you can see that the G-CAMP signal in these um, cells that are very uh, that are near the lesion, um, they, the signal is um, out of phase uh, compared to compared to um, this pretty synchronized signal in the um, the normal heart. And so we can use this tool to look at the interactions in between um, these uh, these uh, out of phase activities that could contribute to things like um, arrhythmias. Um, in, in, um, in, in heart failure or in a rhythmic, um, in a cardiac flutter or something like that. It's also interesting that you can see all the capillaries. Like um, um, I was quite surprised actually when kind of moving from the heart to, or from the brain to the heart, it turns out that the heart is, um, is, is even more vascularized than the brain. Although we, we always talk about the brain being highly vascularized. Um, and, uh, and um, at least the heart has sort of a, a parallel structure in that it has its big blood vessels on the surface and it has um, uh, penetrating arterioles that go into this very fine capillary bed. So um, interesting analogies to think about. Okay, so we can um, use some of the same methods to, to study that we used in the brain to study what's going on in the heart. Um, and so here, um, this is a, a infarction that's actually done with a, um, a liquid nitrogen um, cooled probe, but this was done in a mouse model that expresses GFP in um, the resident macrophages. So this is actually the same mouse that we use to study the microglia dynamics in, in, um, in, the, uh, in, the, in the brain cells or in the, uh, in the Alzheimer's mouse. And so what this is showing here is a reconstruction in the healthy part of the heart. Um, and the, the, the magenta shows the blood vessels and um, the green here are the CX3CR1 GFP expressing resident macrophages here. And um, this is seven days after infarction, just like we, what we can see in the brain tissue, you can see that these, um, these cells have multiplied and they've also um, changed in morphology. And then, um, this movie shows um, these are this is this it's motion on both um, uh, both of these um, even though this isn't moving very much from these three D volumes we can um, construct uh, like vector maps of where uh, the motion and the contractility is happening and so um, at least in this case it's quite obvious that this one isn't um, moving very much but we can use this to do a quantified um, a quantification of the function of the heart near um, near something like a, an injury or in disease models. So um, here you can we can sort of see, this is a quantification of the trajectories of motion. Oh no, something flipped upside down. Um, but at any rate, um, you can see that uh, um, we can see the motion of oh, the overall motion um, is changed quite a bit when you do a um, when you have a lesion in the heart. And these are still images from that that same example. So um, we've recently started studying um, heart failure in in um, in these in in using these tools. And um, there's actually two kinds of heart failure. And one is heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, which is um, uh, which is actually. Um, so I guess the more traditional form of heart failure. And another model of um, heart failure or another type of heart failure is heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And um, these two, um, um, 
the, the split is clinically quite significant because it turns out about half of the patients have um, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. But unlike the heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, um, there are no, there are no um, disease modifying therapies for this. Um, these are diseases that um, are, are um, um, characterized by a uh, chronic inflammatory condition. So um, typically you might, you might not have like, um, like an infarction. So you, so it might not be like one of the big blood vessels is clotted and you, um, but it's sort of more a distributed pathology. So in some ways it's, um, it's sort of like Alzheimer's disease where there's a smoldering, um, but, uh, quite dispersed, um, low levels of inflammation that are there constantly. So we started using two photon imaging to um, study this. And then um, we use sort of a, a new model, but I'm just gonna sort of skip to some of the results here. It does cause um, an enlargement of the, of the heart, um, which, is, which is reflective of the human disease. And here's some two photon imaging of um, the, uh, um, a normal mouse and a HEFPEF model mouse, this heart failure with preserved ejection fraction mouse. Um, and um, so to stimulate the heart, we also um, inject a little bit of epinephrine. So this is sort of like a, a virtual stress test here. And so you can really see the capillaries and you can kind of get a sense of um, their motion. And then with the normal mouse, you can see with the um, epinephrine, um, the motion is, um, is quite, um, um, increased in, in amplitude. Um, in HEFPEF, you can also see that um, there is an increase in motion with um, stimulation, um, but um, it, it's, it's smaller and it looks to me a little bit like it might not be as coordinated. This is a relatively small region of the heart, so you'd really expect it to be um, uh, more uniform uh, like, like this thing. So one of the really neat things that we can do is look at the capillaries. And you, you can do these kinds of um, motion extractions um, through like an extracted heart, for example. And that's, that's um, the way a lot of this has been studied. But being able to look at these capillaries as it functions is kind of a very new thing. So when we did that, um, we noticed something that was actually very similar to what you can see in Alzheimer's disease. So in this mouse, um, oh, sorry, uh, we used um, a mouse model where we had the neutrophils in red. And so in this movie, you can just sort of see the, a red flash of um, a neutrophil going by. And so um, this is what a neutrophil looks like in the normal heart. It just goes right through the blood vessels and it doesn't stick. But in um, the models of heart failure, um, we saw something else, and this is a little bit hard to see, but if you look very carefully and sort of um, train your eye on this region, there is a neutrophil that appears again and again in exactly the same um, vessel. There are also some neutrophils that if you um, uh, track very carefully, you can see that it um, very slowly over many heartbeats starts to move down um, a blood vessel. So this is actually exactly reminiscent of some of the things that we see in Alzheimer's disease. So these are spontaneous um, occlusions by neutrophils in a organ that has sort of a, a chronic um, inflammatory um, uh, condition here. And so um, um, uh, I hope I'm not like simplifying too much by saying the heart and the, and the brain are equivalent, but it does make you think that this, this phenomenon of this um, uh, low grade inflammation might have this effect where um, in many organs where perhaps this, this sort of stalling of blood flow in the capillaries is enough to be functional or functionally significant. Okay, so um, I'm sort of gonna accelerate because um, I wanted to not keep you for too long and hopefully have some time for questions. But at any rate, um, we, do, we did quantify the number of stalled vessels that we have, um, and it is increased in these heart failure models. So both the slowed and the stalled um, vessels um, are, are increased. Um, it does turn out that these are neutrophils like they are in Alzheimer's disease. Um, so we can use the same um, Li6G antibody treatment to, to um, deplete the neutrophils and then study what the effects of, um, of uh, neutrophil depletion and getting rid of these stalls are. So unlike in the brain, um, 
we don't have a good way of looking at blood flow, even though we can look at these red blood cells and things. Um, it's actually very difficult for us to quantify the motion of the red blood cells here uh, because it changes heartbeat to heartbeat. So we don't have a good measure of whether or not blood flow actually increases. But we do have some interesting data on changes in um, other measures. So. Um, in these sections, what we're seeing is a cross section um, of the hearts um, on the on the um, on in both cases. These are hearts with uh, the heart failure model, um, and these have been stained and treated with hypoxy probe. And so, um, a hypoxy probe is is um, is uh, causes a, a chemical reaction that accumulates in tissue that has low levels of oxygenation. And so it's used as sort of a measure of um, decreases in, in blood flow um, and um, that are significant enough to cause decreases in oxygenation tension. So um, what we found was um, with a week of treating uh, or eliminating neutrophils, we found that um, the hypoxia levels according to this this assay were, were improved. And so we can see that there's really bright red um, all over the um, isotype control treated heart. And then there's um, quite a bit of drop in the signal with a hypoxy probe. So, um, so uh, th this treatment is pretty quick here. That, and this is at the end stage of, um, of this heart failure model, which, um, which is pretty far into, into the um, enlarged heart and, and changes in function. And so we're actually pretty excited that this might actually have um, a functional um, consequence. And we've also been looking at some exercise intolerance models. And although the change at this very late, late stage is um, small, you can actually see that there's a little bit of improvement in um, exercise intolerance, even with a day of treatment with this li um, Li6G. So that actually indicates that um, there are probably um, consequential blood flow changes that are due to this capillary effect in this, in this heart failure model that probably have a functional um, um, uh, consequence. So maybe, maybe uh, you know, another way similar to the Alzheimer's disease that we could treat some of the symptoms. Okay, so to summarize, um, uh, we've been having a lot of fun doing some cardiac imaging and sort of adapting some of the methods and the tools that we've had in the brain to be able to image in the heart. Um, we got to deal with the motion of the heart, um, but we can do things like look at action potentials. I'm very excited about the fact that we can look at the microvasculature and look at the capillaries. Um, and um, this has led us to um, the idea that very much like an inflammatory brain disease like Alzheimer's disease, um, this inflammatory form of heart failure, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, um, we see evidence that this leads to uh, a microvascular dysfunction where capillaries are plugged by, um, again, neutrophils, so the same, ce same cell that was implicated in Alzheimer's disease. And we're getting some um, indication that if you treat these stalls in the heart, that we can improve some of um, the hypoxia for sure, and perhaps some of the function as well. So let me just finish um, by sort of trying to tie together some of the common observations here that we have with two photon microscopy. So we've chosen here to look at um, several diseases that have chronic sort of mild inflammation, um, but both of these have led to a, um, an organ-wide blood flow deficit. And what we think is happening here, rather than having something like a major heart attack or a major stroke where one of the big blood vessels is clotted, we think this is actually the result of a cumulative sort of resistance change in the vascular network where you have a few, not that many, but um, a few capillaries stalled and that leads to, um, leads to a, a uh, overall change in resistance in the, in the vasculature of the whole organ and a drop in the delivery of blood to the whole organ. So in Alzheimer's disease mice, we can get a really fast hours functional recovery in um, a memory test in the mice when we get rid of this blood flow um, um, deficit. Um, in heart, we're still working on this, so we'll have to be able to answer for you later whether the perfusion has changed, although the hypoxia change, and whether or not um, this, this leads to a functional, um, whether the functional change truly is due to the flow deficit. 
and also whether this is a, a cause or effect. So we're, we're currently working on sort of long-term treatment of this blood flow to see if this makes a, um, a difference in the, um, in, the, in, the, in the progression of the disease. So with that, I'd like to point out some of the people that did the study. So um, I think I was able to point out the cardiac team here. Um, Mike Kotlikoff um, is, uh, is um, well, he's the provost of Cornell, but he's also a collaborator on this project. And, and we also work a lot with Chris Shu. Um, the Alzheimer's study was let, has involved a lot of people, collaborators, um, Kasi Adekola and, and, um, and Liebeck Park at Weill. Um, and Sylvie Lertois does modeling for us. And uh, Pietro is the human computation institute that, um, that works on the, the game. So the people that did the work, the postdocs and the grad students is, um, and undergrad students, um, there's quite a few of them, but I do wanna point out um, Oliver uh, postdoc who's going to, um, going to Miami um, as a faculty position and JC who's, um, who's a postdoc now um, and in Boston and Sylvia who's also in Boston as, as the ones that have done the work. So I also point out my partner in crime, Chris Schaefer. Um, and um, uh, thank you very much for your attention and, um, and, I'd, and I'd love to take some questions if that's possible. <laughs>